Well, they say everything looks yellow new with John just died. So this is the second time that uh, Jim has introduced me, and it's usually not politically correct to disagree with that uh, person who introduced you, but I don't see things getting better at UCLA. Jim continues to see the glass is half full, and I see it as getting worse. And so that's why I'm on a flight to China tonight. I waited to take this flight to my home in China so I could speak with you. I will continue to fight for freedoms, principles that I feel strongly with. And tonight I'm going to peel back the onion and you can go back and think of what Jim said. Are things getting better here or not? The title of tonight's speech is The Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Scam. Scam. And I believe UCLA's Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion that was established in 2015 is acting inimical to basic Bruin values and fundamental American values, and worse than that, they're creating an environment at UCLA which is making the campus not as safe for women on campus. Just listen for the next 45 minutes and I think you'll be shocked. And the reason I'm not here, it's not because I was so popular, it's because I am willing to challenge the university at every step and to fight for basic freedoms and to fight for students. And so after tonight's speech, I guess you're probably going to give a good view of why Jerry Kang doesn't like me, Chancellor Block doesn't like me, uh, and the left on the campus doesn't like me. It's a delicious irony that I'm actually in Royce Hall speaking to you tonight because, as Jim said, some 40 years ago, I slept in Royce 232. Lisa Bloom was my college debate partner. Back in those days, she was to the left, I was to the right. Students got along. You learned from students with different points of view. And we did win three national debate championships. One of the topics, ironically, that um, well, we won a championship on was unauthorized immigration into the United States is seriously detrimental to the United States. And in arguing that proposition, we would talk about illegal aliens. Yes, illegal aliens, not undocumented workers, illegal aliens taking American jobs. Now, could you imagine that being discussed in a college classroom at UCLA today? No. I mean, that's, that's a microaggression. <laughs> you would need trigger warnings. <laughs> well, I also happened to teach before I was uh, summarily um, uh, dismissed for not being excellent. Uh, I used to teach uh, down the hall a class called Arguing Contemporary Social Issues. Well, one of the topics that we would discuss is resolved. The Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Department should be abolished. So this is going to get into this tonight, and you can make your own determination whether or not um, the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion uh, Department uh, is of any benefit to UCLA students. I think you're being scammed. Um, the campus is not a better place. And when I go through some discrete examples, it's my belief that the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Department enacts policies and takes steps uh, that vitiate the notion of academic freedom. Secondly, um, the middle word is, uh, well, the first word is diversity, equity, and inclusion. All of the policies enacted by Jerry Kang's office, they don't encompass diversity of thought. He has his own right, uh, left-wing, progressive, liberal agenda. It's not diversity of thought. You guys just um, put your hand over your heart to the American flag, and God bless the USA. That is, that is triggering. That is not consistent with um, uh, Jerry Kang's agenda. And the last thing uh, uh, I'm going to discuss tonight in screen examples is uh, the Title IX department, which is supposed to make the campus safer for women, uh, I, I, you'll see it, it uh, lies to the students uh, and refuses to enact policies um, to make the campus safer for students. So let me get into specific examples. This is why they want me gone. I have information and knowledge that nobody else knows, that the administration won't tell you. I don't know if the Daily Bloom showed up today. I hope, they, uh, I hope they did. They seem to always miss my speeches. They need to cover this because they're being scammed and you're being scammed. So let's start with this photo. This photo just happened to be in the Daily Bloom. These two individuals, all right. The tall individual, do you know who he is? That's Jerry Kang. 
Vice Chancellor Jerry Kang. He has built the Leviathan, his Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Department. He makes $444,000 a year, four times more than a regular professor. His Leviathan has many, many departments, a budget over $4 million. One of his departments is Title IX. The person next to him, you'd have no idea who she is. And if you read the Daily Bruin article, her name is Jane Batar. She worked for UCLA for 37 years as a low-level functionary in the Communication Studies Department. She retired all of a sudden this year. And if you picked up the Daily Bruin on the day it comes from the Daily Bruin, you would have seen Vice Chancellor Ken giving an award and a $4,000 gift, the Chancellor's Award, to Jane Batar. And you guys would be none the wiser. You would think Jane Batar, she was a dedicated employee, she must have been in good service to the university, and that's why she got the award. Why is Jerry King giving her the award? Seems somewhat bizarre to me, the Title IX department. On the same day that she received this award, another vice chancellor was giving another professor an award. Why did they choose Jerry King? Well, just think about it for a minute. Now let me give you a chronology of Jane Batar and Jerry Kang and Keith Fink and Justin Gelheiser. So you can see the dirty laundry in the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Department. On May 27th of 2017, I submitted my final paperwork to Dean Gomez in my battle to remain a teacher at UCLA. This is after teaching here for 10 years and trying to get rid of me. Someone I never met named Justin Gelheiser. He was a TA in my department. He had an undergraduate degree at Penn. He was in the education department here, a TA in the comm department, the highest rated TA. Always would ask the students, if I had to sit in one class, one teacher, whose class to sit in? Sit in face. You know, the guy sat in my class for years, thought I was great. Students would say, well, Keith does so much for us outside of class to, to help us. He thought I was a good guy. Never met the guy. He was on the academic senate. He made a mistake. He spoke out in defense of me. On June 5th of 2017, he wrote a letter to Dean Gomez, and he copied the department supporting me. You think, okay, there's no problem. All of a sudden, on July 13th, well, I got fired on June 30th, if you guys don't know that. June 27th, I got fired on June 30th. On July 13th, this person, an administrator in the comm department, sends an email, Justin, we'd like to speak with you. Thinks nothing of it, he's a TA, comes into her office, she's sitting with Pia Spenson, another administrator in the department. And all of a sudden, he said, he, he's confronted, well, there's a sexual harassment allegation against you. This is very serious, Justin. Your career could be destroyed, and your career will be destroyed if you don't resign from your teaching duties in the Comm Studies Department. Now, do you guys know what the policy is here? If an administrator actually has a complaint of sexual harassment, well, if you're following what Jerry King says, because on Jerry King's watch, there's been a whole uh, uh, different tenor and approach to sexual assault claims, we now have a mandatory reporting requirement. So if Jane Batar really knew about sexual harassment, as a low-level administrator, she is not to do the investigation of Justin Gelheiser. She's to report it to Title IX. So she threatened Justin Gelheiser to leave the department. Just like me, she picked on the wrong, she picked the wrong guy. So he didn't go away so easily. That's in July of 2017. Now, if you're just following this through, if there's really a board of sexual harassment, it has to go to Title IX at some point in time. They're then supposed to investigate. Just follow the chronology. So in August of 2017, Gelheiser files a grievance. If you're a, a staff or faculty here and you want to have a grievance against UCLA and you're dealing with the union, I mean, you're going to get caught up in a mill uh, with the weakest advocacy for years. So he files it in August uh, uh, of 2017. He's not getting anywhere with the grievance. Mohammed Cato, uh, gets elevated to be the new director of Title IX. In November of 2017, Gail Heiser goes to Cato and, and he says exactly what happened. You need to do an investigation. This is wrong. 
uh, they try to uh, repress my rights by using Title IX uh, uh, as a sword. And nothing happened with Title IX itself. There was no investigation into the claim uh, of, of harassment. The question to Mr. Cato, was there ever a complaint to the Title IX department as Jane, uh, uh, as Jane Batar should have made a complaint? In the grievance proceeding, Pia Svensson says that they reported on July 14th. Again, I wish the Bruin is here. The Bruin is here and you're following the story. You called Justin Gelheiser. He has the smoking guns that Muhammad Cato told him all sorts of differing stories. We never got the complaint. We got the complaint months later. We got the complaint on July 16th. We got the complaint on July 17th. Any way you slice it, Jane Batar violated the mandatory reporting uh, requirement. But why wasn't there any investigation done by Muhammad Cato? So that's in November. December of 2017, Gail Heiser files a complaint with the Department of Education. January 10, my nonprofit organization to help students and teachers files an amended complaint. January 24th, the Department of Education decides they're going to investigate UCLA for an attempt to use Title IX uh, to blackmail a student. January 24th. UCLA has done nothing since that time to investigate this. What do you think that happens a few days later? All of a sudden, Jerry King wakes up, and on January 30th, six days later, now he's going to have an investigation into Gail Heiser's complaint. What a joke. So they have uh, now an investigator appointed named Lee Fellers to do an investigation. Of course, we tell Gail Heiser not to engage in this farce they already know what your story is. They don't need your testimony. Notwithstanding this, there has to be right a sacrificial lamb because Jerry King's not going to go down. UCLA's not going to lose hundreds of millions of partners with the Department of Education. So here's the finding of April 23rd, 2018. And remember, she got an award of $4,000 as being the best staff member at UCLA. Here's the finding by um, Lee Fellows. The two employees spoke to and questioned Mr. Galsheiser concerning a potential Title IX matter. This was inconsistent with instructions provided in the UC sexual violence and sexual assault prevention training they had taken. But she's going to get an award of $4,000 by Jerry Kang. It gets even funnier. The last sentence of the first point, their intention in doing so was to protect Mr. Galsheiser due to their good relationship with him. Now, how are they going to protect him? I thought this was a claim of sexual harassment, which we were discussing. If you believe what she's saying, they were going to protect him by not reporting it to Title IX and letting him go on his way. Second point, one of the two employees spoke to other members of the comm department about the Title IX report concerning Mr. Gelheiser who did not have a legitimate need to know about the report. This was inconsistent with instructions based on UC material. That was Jane Batar. These are the findings of Lee Feller just a month or two before this award is given to Jane Batar. Feller concludes her report, appropriate university administrators will be notified, no doubt Jerry Kane, of the findings and whether any corrective or remedial action is appropriate. Now, you can connect the dots as easy as I can. Obviously, Jane Batar had to go. They didn't want to fire Jane Batar because Jane Batar could upset the entire apple cart on them when the Department of Education comes calling, which they're going to come calling, and I'm going to be there to help the Department of Education extirpate uh, those individuals at UCLA who are taking steps anathema to principles that we believe in. She was a sacrificial lamb. So they come up, this is just me, you can reach your own conclusions. They come up with some way to appease Jane Batar instead of firing her and have a rabbit dog on their tail. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sink you guys because I did give a report, or I didn't give a report. So they decide to give her $4,000, give her a photograph, give her a certificate, and everybody thinks she was a great employee. Why is Jerry Kane there? You, you figure it out. Oh, but it gets better. It just gets better. Oh, before I get to... 
Now let's think about this on the timeline here. So, indulging in their fantasy, we know that there was uh, a sexual harassment uh, issue that came to the comm department. Their position is they told the Title IX office. Did the Title IX office investigate this sexual harassment claim? The story, as told by Muhammad Cato to Justin Gelheiser, because Gelheiser was never called in, right? Because it's all a fiction. They were trying to get rid of Justin Gelheiser because of his support of me. It was all made up. But if you just indulge in the fiction that there was a harassment complaint and it was reported to UCLA, you would think they would investigate. But of course, they never investigated because they never contacted Gelheiser because there never was a complaint. Their story is, we made a contact to the claim victim, and she never responded. Therefore, matter closed. This should really infuriate you more than everything else I've said up until now. What does that mean? If a woman is raped and assaulted and in a coma, or she doesn't want to respond to the Title IX inquiry, that's it? There's no investigation? The matter's closed? That's nonsense. Even if a victim is unwilling to cooperate, UCLA has an affirmative duty to investigate. The simple thing to do is, you know that Gelheiser is the purported assailant, call Gelheiser in. Question him about the incident. It's just one lie after another lie after another lie, but they think they can sweep it all under the rug. They can lie to the broom, they can lie to you, and nobody, everybody is none the wiser. But let's just, oh, maybe Keith, you haven't persuaded me. Oh, with all of these uh, faults of Jane Batar, maybe she did deserve the, uh, the award. Well, let's go to the next photo here. I don't know if you guys believe in the right to privacy. I don't know if the most comprehensive of rights and the right most valued by civilized man is what the left usually says. And you see this? It's like a camera. It's like a camera to me being hidden under flowers. Guess what department this camera uh, was placed in? guessed it, Com Studies, the same department that Jane Batar ran as the administrator. So in the grievance I told you that Gelheiser filed in August, Gelheiser discovered that Jane Batar was secretly taping and listening to communication studies students and anyone that came to the Com Studies department. UCLA is aware of this, but of course nothing was done other than to give Jane Batar the plaque with $4,000 and a handshake and a Daily Bruin article thanking her for 37 years of service. So that's one piece, uh, one incident that you guys know nothing about, nobody knows anything about, uh, but there are so many levels here uh, uh, where you should be angry. UCLA trying to repress students and teachers' political beliefs. UCLA retaliating against those who support others' political speech. UCLA misusing the Title IX process. <laughs> UCLA refusing to follow through correctly to protect women in the Title IX process. And the entire UCLA community through the Title IX process. And I don't know, worse of all, is UCLA lying and lying and lying uh, about the incident. I don't know how many values uh, are up upended just by that one story. And I don't have time to get into my story. You should have listened to that speech uh, last year. That was over an hour uh, of the horrible acts they took with respect to me. But I can fight. We'll get to that in a minute. But I can fight, and I can take care of myself. But most students and most teachers cannot. And we'll get to that at the very end. So now I want to move to uh, the second area, um, dealing with the, uh, the equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, department. This deals with sexual assault and sexual harassment at fraternities. Now, if you ever heard me speak uh, on the topic of sexual assault and sexual harassment, and I know this is uh, the, the, the left is not fond of my, my take on this, is I don't believe one in four or one in five women are assaulted on campus. The methodology of those, those statistics is flawed uh, for a variety of reasons. But I'm not shorn of my cognitive process, processes. I know that assaults occur. Uh, and the large number of assaults occur either in fraternities or they occur in the dormitories. Okay, that's, and that's the same as UCLA as any other campus. You can look at their own statistics. And we all know that most of these sexual assaults and rapes have a link to alcohol. 
You don't need to be a genius to know that. And if you've been at UCLA at any amount of time or any college, you know how out of hand the drinking is. They even have something called pre-gaming. Pre-gaming is when the fraternity guys get together and they start getting wasted even before the party. That's the term used. Everybody knows what's going on, but UCLA does nothing. Now let me tell you what happened to two girls on campus. And all of you women that are, are in here, you think about whether or not UCLA took actions when they knew about these rapes to protect you or inform you that you shouldn't go into ZBT. In October of 2015, a young girl, less than 18, was raped at ZBT. Now, as I understand statutory rape, if a woman is raped, if, she, if, if there's sex that's not consented and you're under 18, that's statutory rape. So if UCLA found out at some point in time a statutory rape occurred, under the Clery Act, they are required to report that. I'll show you UCLA's own chart. To me, the number one statutory rape is one, not zero. You can look at the box when I put the box up. Anyway, that's October of 2015. She doesn't report it. August of 2016, another rape at CBT by the same person, the same person that raped the first girl. This is, this is woman number two. Woman number two happened to know me because I was her teacher. I'm not on pro-male because I'm for due process or pro-female because I don't believe in sexual assault. And it's absurd when people start dividing people, you're on one side or the other. Uh, she happens to actually be liberal, uh, but I'm a, I'm a good teacher, I'm engaging, and uh, I, people can tell that I'm caring. So her family was out of state, she bonded with me, uh, and she confided in me what happened. So I walked her through the various things that she could do. She had tried to resolve this on her own. She went to ZBT. She confronted the president. Worse than the president, she confronted the faculty advisor, a guy just like me, someone that went to UCLA, who's a lawyer, that's supposed to do the right thing. They were all trying to sweep it under the rug. What you're saying is not credible. We can't confirm it. She got nowhere. So that's August 2016. She complained to ZBT, got her run around. Okay, I convinced her, I don't convince her, she's a college student like you, she's intelligent and she's at UCLA. She decides, along with her friend, because she found out that uh, her friend was also raped, they both file a complaint with UCLA in February of 2017. Now UCLA knows, same guy, two rapes at ZBT. I just ask you, if you're a woman on campus, do you want to know at that point in time, maybe you should stay away from ZBT. You don't need to know that guy's name, but maybe UCLA, if they actually have a policy of being transparent, needs to inform you that there's been two sexual assaults at ZBT. I don't know, that's just me. To me, that, that, to me that's transparency of letting students know what's going on. So. Complaints made in February 2017. Now, if you look at what Jerry Kang says, every time there's criticism of UCLA's handling of sexual assault, sexual harassment, his fallback is, that was then, this is now. And I've instituted all sorts of new policies. We've gone from two people to seven people. We have better investigators. And the process is more expeditious. So this complaint was made in February 17. The general guidelines for the Department of Education is to have completion of a complaint within 60 days. UCLA took nine months. It's far from Jerry Kane's words that the new policies are more expeditious, and no woman wants to go through a nine-month process of an investigation. But put that aside. This is nine months where the potential rapist is on campus. How is that making the campus safer to elongate the process for nine months? And I've been in these, this process with others, representing males who don't get due process rights. It never gets done in 60 days. There's always an extension after an extension after an extension. So, nine months, the student is expelled. Both claims the, 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 the investigator finds to be valid, the student is expelled. The, student, um, the, the, the alleged rapist is now in another school. 
That's in October of 2017. So now UCLA knows about it. They know that there was a rape that occurred at CBT, that the faculty member did nothing to try, never let Title IX know. Is there any punishment to CBT? Is the faculty member uh, mandated to be re removed? Does UCLA do anything with respect to changing its policies on alcohol? Not, nothing, nothing is done. So what happens? In January of 2018, there's another rape at a different fraternity by a president linked to alcohol. Now this event leads to a complaint with law enforcement. Well, just like before. Now the public knows. Now something's going to be done. So in January 2018, after this rape, UCLA for one month instituted a policy, do you guys know this, of, of no alcohol. One month. It was abandoned. Why wasn't this done before? Only one month. Then they stopped that policy. We filed a lawsuit that one of uh, my two, the, the, the student of mine, one of the two girls, she's got, anyway, she's got some fire in her. Uh, she was willing to file a lawsuit because of the principal. We filed a lawsuit in August of 2018, a, a civil complaint spelling out what I just told you. UCLA now uh, is following the IFC and there's going to be um, no alcohol greater than 15%, but still the policy, it starts September 1, 2018, they have all the way to September 2019. I don't know why they don't go to a zero alcohol policy. You have to be over 21 to drink anyway. Most folks aren't over 21. You don't need to drink at the fraternities. Uh, and if we're talking about safety and you want to enact various policies, it seems to make eminent sense to me. Or you can have a lot better risk management policies and education for, uh, for the students than they have now. Uh, so just to kind of circle back on some issues here uh, that uh, if I give you too much information, you're losing the timeline. When, when, uh, when, when Vice Chancellor King says that they're now speeding up resolutions, that's far from the truth. This one took nine months. It takes a long time. UCLA ignores repeatedly its own rules. Here, I'll give you an example. UCLA's written rules at the time with respect to an appeal, three university employees are supposed to sit on the appellate board. UCLA decided to outsource this matter to the same uh, uh, company that hired Lee Fellows. I don't know, you guys can do a public records rep or request and find out how much uh, this arm of Jerry Kang's office gets paid, but uh, I can connect the dots. They do whatever UCLA wants to do. So they now hire, I forget the name of this company, that Fellers works. So they hire to run this appeal, somebody outside. I say, well, wait a minute. This is not consistent with your own rules. <laughs> the response back to me from Cato's office is, we don't have to follow our own rules. Not following our own rules don't fo doesn't violate due process. So too bad, so sad. So they don't, they don't follow their, uh, their own rules. There's also supposed to be a single investigator. Here there was two investigators. I've had other instances where they go from one investigator to two investigators. It all doesn't matter. They have rules, they pay lip service to their rules. Failure to comply with the Clery Act. Do you have this screen here? Okay, here we have the screen. I told you, uh, I started as a math major. This is a joke I use all the time. I started here as a math major, I lasted one quarter. I got blown out. I'm much better with my math, math and analytical skill, uh, skills than uh, with math. But I can't add. <laughs> so it looks every year here, zero, zero, zero in statutory rape. Victim number one was under 18. That's statutory rape. So I think that this, uh, their own statistics uh, uh, are false. Dave, Kang says there's greater accountability, and he posts all these, re uh, these results. Well, that, that stat is false. When he tells you that 80% of the com complaints are resolved, this is, this is one of the issues. You don't have the time to peel back things that this department says. This gentleman is very smart. He has two Harvard degrees. He has a $4 million budget. He has people to help him spin statements that you read and you think sound reasonable. So when he tells you that 80% of cases are resolved, you just probably take that as face value, that people were accorded right a fair process, uh, and they were resolved professionally. You have no idea. If you're a 19-year-old kid accused of rape or accused of sexual assault, 
And Dean Kang's office wants you to take a slight sanction or a small sanction, maybe of going out, uh, being suspended for a year. You might take that deal. That's a resolved case. That doesn't mean it was resolved fairly. The stat of 80% resolved is a, complete, a completely dishonest stat. And just hold that for a minute when we get to the, uh, uh, the issue with faculty. There is no transparency to students. I, I highlighted that point to you. Nobody knew for nine months, uh, actually nobody knew uh, for a long time uh, about these EBT uh, rapes. Uh, they probably didn't know about that until my lawsuit and then we got press coverage on that. Why wasn't there a cross-check done? Have you ever read any of these cross-checks his department puts out? What is he talking about in these cross-checks? He says, dialogue over demagoguery. If there was anything backwards, it's that statement. He's a demagogue. There is no dialogue. There is no uh, difference of thought of any right-wing thought. No discipline. Where's the discipline for the fraternity? Where's the discipline for the supervisor? Next. Refusal to enact policies to protect the students. There's no policy with respect to alcohol going on before this time or at the time. So if you guys want, uh, I think I'll put a link to the video to the complaint that we filed. I spell this out in greater detail. Now I'll move to another area. This has to deal with teachers. This is teacher speech. So this uh, be a myth, the Department of Equity and Inclusion, I told you it's got many, many tentacles. It's got the Title IX tentacle. It's got the um, Discrimination and Prevention Office tentacles. This is another one of his, uh, um, his offices within his office. They investigate reports of discrimination based on race, ancestry, national origin, age, and religion. Just like today, people had to, uh, uh, God, God, uh, you get, this is a God in the Pledge of, uh, uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, someone may make a complaint. The DPO uh, would investigate uh, Professor Enson for that. So that's within his office at DPO. Let me give you some examples, and I've changed the departments to protect the innocent. Uh, and this has all happened this year where Jerry King's office has gone after teachers. So we have a film school. The film school has a white male teacher over 25. Now what's the problem when you have a white male teacher? Enstrom is as white as a ghost, and so am I. Now, even though you may look at my history and say, uh, you, uh, you, I can, uh, you know, Republicans actually can advocate for women's rights. Uh, I know that's very hard for the left to understand that. Uh, but I do, uh, I don't know, I've had almost my entire office is female. I've had 23 years um, fighting for women's rights and sexual harassment, sexual assault cases. Um, I've taught between law school and UCLA thousands and thousands of women. I've been mentored to thousands and thousands of women. So I may make a good case that I'm not biased, but you know I am biased. And why is that? It's because I'm white. And what's the term for that? What do I have? It's on the diversity of equity and inclusion. Uh, Jim, you need to check yourself. What is it? Privilege. It's implicit bias. Even if you're not biased outwardly, we know that you are biased. It's implicit bias, okay? And he studied this, and he's written papers on this, and he gets paid to speak on this. And this is what he knows. And this is, uh, and this is, this is where his department comes from. So the film school, you have a white male... And, you know, I don't know the inner workings in there, but I can guess. You know, I know that I'm enemy number one, um, and they had my target for a long time. But I'm sure there's a whole big board of the white male teachers that they're looking to, uh, to nail. So this guy in the film school, white male teacher over 25 years, who of course we know is biased even though he has no outward manifestations of being biased. So in his film school, he asked students to watch a movie and then give a synopsis to the class of the movie. And after that, he then, the teacher then critiques it. So this student is from China. The student gives a speech that's critical of the movie because the movie portrays yellow, yellow people in a negative light as compared to, these are his words, brown people and white people. That's the basic premise uh, of the student's take on the movie. Okay, so the teacher listens to this. He has a one-page sheet with a summary also from the student because he has many students giving summaries. And the student writes on there the same yellow people. So the teacher in response says, well, your speech uh, on this movie was good in this respect. When you got into the yellow people, it was bad here. And the teacher is videotaping, so we're videotaping, he's videotaping the critique so the students can watch their speech again and they can and videotape uh, the critique. This 
student never makes a complaint to, the, to Title IX uh, or to Kang's office. Now remember what I told you before when we were talking about sexual assault. They refused to investigate a complaint when the complainant didn't respond. Now this student doesn't make a complaint, but somehow Kang's department catches wind that this teacher made the yellow people comment, right? And yellow people in a vacuum is pejorative. Right? Just like yellow journalism. It's yellow people comment. That's a negative slight towards Asians. So the teacher of 25 years gets from the department, the PPO department, a long document, a scary document, that Adam rates UCLA's policies on harassment and discrimination that the teacher potentially violated. That's scary when your whole career now can go up in smoke because Jerry Kang's office is investigating you based on this statement, this statement, and that statement. What are you going to do as a teacher? Remember, 80% of the cases are resolved. If Jerry Kang says, go um, you know, get some re-education, you know, some kind of Manchur Manchurian candidacy uh, uh, so you can get uh, these yellow people uh, comments out of your head, you'll take that in a heartbeat. What, are you going to go lawyer up? Luckily, my name continues to be out there. It's trickling down teachers that the guy to call was Keith Fink. I know how to read this stuff. I know what the law is. Uh, and I know how then to help a teacher put UCLA in a bat in, in a box. We can get to that in a minute. But this teacher, they came after this teacher, even though there was no complaint made by this student. I know it's is it, it's hard to believe, but this is what's happening. The art school. Now the art school. This teacher wanted to uh, show the students perhaps uh, how to dress, or the fashion teacher. So the teacher, in doing that, used a black mannequin. The problem wasn't so much that the mannequin was black. It was the hair the teacher put on the mannequin. It was an afro. Well, why would you put an afro on a black mannequin? That has to be racist. That's a microaggression. But black people, well, they all have afros? That's a stereotype. I mean, really, you can't make this up. That was the claim. Again, the teacher gets the same thing. The teacher's career can go up in smoke. Well, who knows, fire or not fire, uh, but discipline for violating the harassment and discrimination program. I told you, Jerry Kang is about the smartest guy on campus. He's no dummy. He has a Harvard Law degree. He absolutely knows the law. And he absolutely knows when his minions are sending out these interorum letters to students and teachers that the teacher has done nothing illegal. It's not a violation of the law. It's not a violation of UCLA policy. Number one, in order for something to be harassing, it has to be severe and pervasive conduct. What I just told you with a single yellow people comment, with a single mannequin, that's not severe or pervasive. Secondly, in order for there to be a, a violation of civil rights laws, something has to affect a student's educational opportunities. There was none with the mannequin. There was none with the yellow people comment. Moreover, it's a violation of the basic tenet of academic freedom for his department to come in and to tell the first teacher the way the teacher should comport himself and the words that his teacher should use in interacting with the student. It's the same thing vis-a-vis -vis, um, the decision of what mannequin to wear. And what here to put on? Just wondering, what if the teacher, what if, what if the mannequin was bald? Isn't that also a microaggression? What, does every black person look like Michael Jordan? <laughs> I mean, what if the teacher used a white mannequin? Isn't that also discriminatory? Why did you choose a white mannequin? What about, what about the brown people? What about the black people? I mean, I guess any way you slice it, if you're on Kane's radar, you can be scared. These are just two examples. I don't know how many others, right, because I only know what I know, and I'm lucky to know right more than you because I have students that come to me with the dirty laundry. I have teachers that come to me with the dirty laundry. If I didn't have this, I'd be as ignorant as you and as everybody else uh, at UCLA. And I would believe that Jane Bedar deserved to get a $4,000 check and a gold plate. All right, so that's the last point dealing with the teachers, um, uh, which is very scary uh, at UCLA. You realize UCLA just decided to adopt that all teachers on tenure, tenure track have to give an EDI statement. 
And if you want to seek a promotion, you have to give an EDI statement. I don't know if you've heard about that. An EDI statement right is some statement consistent with what you've done for equality, diversity, and inclusion. Now, could you imagine someone like Enstrom or myself giving an EDI statement? Well, let me think. What is my EDI statement? Well, let's say I support those students at Harvard that are challenging Harvard's discriminatory practices in giving preference to black students. And in fact, I believe that Harvard should judge people based on merit. And as a result, the, there should be 43% Asians at Harvard and less than 1%. And this is consistent um, uh, with what's good for all the students at Harvard and also good for the minority students because of the mismatch theory. Professor Sanders, uh, one of the scholars in the country from UCLA Law School in the mismatch theory. In fact, the black students, uh, it's a disadvantage. You're not supposed to use the word black or more right to. That's also uh, offensive. The African-American students, even though we don't know that they're uh, from Africa or American, but as the African-American students who are being uh, uh, dumped up, they would be better going to a school right where, where they're on equal footing with their classmates. Now, do you think that type of statement is what they want to hear with the EDI statement? No, of course not. It's, it's contrary. What, you want to hear my statement that I don't believe in the living wage and minimum wage? Uh, this is an ideological screening test. To me, this is frightening. An ideological screening test. UCLA didn't have to adopt this. This comes from Kang's office. This is because UCLA, they really do have a very, a very strong uh, progressive agenda, and this agenda will brook no opposition. All right, you guys, you've heard me speak for about, I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes. I mean, one thing, I'm a good speaker. I can speak in my sleep. I mean, this is so bizarre. Why did you get fired? How could they fire you? Is there a better speaker on campus? Why did they fire you? You're a good speaker. You can entertain students. Students like you. You must know the subject matter, because you're a famous lawyer. You are a star as a student here. Why did they fire you? I mean, we're not getting into my firing, but I got kind of fall in line when I'm just telling you. They fired me, it was partly because of my political speech, but I think it's actually the other more so. I push back at the administration. They don't want pushback. I am their worst nightmare that you listen to me. You're only a class now of 35 people. I used to have 300 every quarter. I'd have a bigger room, they wouldn't give me a bigger room. They want me far away from campus because they don't want people speaking out trying to do better for the UCLA community. That's so upside down. It is. I have no, I don't know Jerry Kang. I have no issue with Jerry Kang. I don't personally know Jerry Block. I have no personal issue with him. I am just for basic broom values, fundamental American values, um, due process. So the, the, the diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, uh, it's a scam. It's worse than a scam. We're spending millions of taxpayer dollars. Millions. I told you it's over $4 million. For what? Why do we need this department? What is it doing for you? I don't think it's doing anything except it's acting uh, anathema to, uh, uh, to the basic principles um, that we hold. So uh, hopefully I ended enough time for you guys to ask me any questions. Um, and thank you for having me. Uh, just one, uh, just quickly, this has got nothing to do with the topic. So uh, unfortunate, you, do you guys know the, 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 the um, uh, parable of the Chinese farmer? So is it, is it, you guys can look this up, but I'm not going to tell you the whole parable. I, I've told it before when I speak. But this is, uh, you never know from an action the consequence whether it's good or bad, right? Right now your house could have burned up, but that may be the best thing. And you guys look up the, the parable of Chinese farmers. So, yeah, I'm disappointed uh, that I'm not able to teach anymore. There was nothing more fulfilling to me uh, than to be able to be a positive influence in the lives of uh, uh, hundreds every year. Uh, uh, UCLA students, because I sat in the same uh, seats that you're sitting in, so while uh, uh, it's a personal loss to me, I think it's more of a loss to the UCLA students, uh, maybe it was a good thing, because I now have my own nonprofit where I simply fight for students' rights and teachers' rights at no cost, uh, and if somebody comes to me and brings me a charge, I will fight for the students, so maybe that's better. Um, I don't know, but there's a, uh, the, the point I was going to say is I'm trying to work with Jim, so I'm a lawyer by trade. I'm glad I figured that out. 
I'm a lawyer by trade. I know a lot of you may be thinking about being lawyers. Even if you're not going to be a lawyer, you're going to be a business person. It's just good to have experience uh, in the legal world. So if we can put together, I pay you, I can't give you credits anymore because I'm not a teacher. I used to be able to, you can do an extra for me. But any of you, you want to come to my office, I have some famous celebrity cases. If you guys are interested in doing that type of stuff, uh, I like to work a program with the Bruno Republicans and maybe the Young American Freedom. I'm going to do it for everybody. Uh, actually, I'm the only person with the right in my office. and I, I just hire people based on merit. It's not, I don't believe in ideological screening. Uh, but I can't, I can't extend this to every organization on campus, but to the Blue Republicans, I'd like to do that, so Jim can work on that. Thank you guys for having me. Anytime I can help you, uh, I'd be honored to be here.